Good afternoon, and thank you, Kay Marie and Horacio, for inviting me to speak today. And I'm not normally this stiff, even though I do work at Harvard. Um, I threw out my back on Monday, and I can barely move, so I, I apologize for seeming like the tin woman. Um, well, that deserves an applause, right, for being capable of coming here and standing <laughs> despite of that. So um, I don't have anything to, um, so I have nothing to disclose. So when you get this call about injury to the pancreatic tail when the splenic flexure has been mobilized by the colorectal surgeons, I tried to find what the incidence was. And it turns out that actually it's not really reported in the way that might, might be useful for us. It tends to be a fairly low percentage, right? Most of our colorectal surgeons are incredibly talented surgeons, and they know what they're looking for. And the pancreatic tail doesn't usually come down. However, there are quite a few patients who have the variation where the tail actually doesn't go straight into the splenic hilum, but actually curves down. For splenectomies, when people are doing upfront splenectomies for a variety of reasons, they tend to injure the tail of the pancreas in the hot when they're getting control of the hilum in about 10% of patients. And so the problem is, though, when you do get a pancreatic fistula and it's unrecognized, it can really cause a lot of problems for the patients because you end up with pancreatic fluid, juice sitting there in that operative bed, and it starts to eat away at the fat and the other tissues that are in that area. And the patient's can sometimes end up with a significant amount of necrosis that requires not only an interventional radiology drain, which is not that big of a deal. Uh, the patients might disagree because they're annoying and they stay in for a long time. But if they really do get a lot of necrosis in that area, you may have to take them back to the operating room and think about debridement. And so when do these things happen, right? You have the, the difficult flexure. And these are sort of three different ways that... Um, at least the colorectal surgeons at our institution, approach the mobilization of the splenic flexure. And you can see in all three of the images how the pancreatic body and tail end up being fairly close to where you are. But again, most of the colorectal surgeons are such fantastic surgeons, and they are very aware of this, and it doesn't happen as often. So what I thought we would do is talk about the three different grades of injuries that could possibly happen. And the best case scenario, if there is a best case scenario, where you just have a small parenchymal injury and you start to realize immediately, oh, that's actually the pancreatic tail, and you back away from it. And there's no injury to the main pancreatic duct. I would encourage you not to take the bovie and start to bovi the heck out of the pancreas. It, one, it doesn't really work, and two, it makes the leak worse, and three, it doesn't, it, it just, it, it doesn't cause a, a good amount of hemostasis. It's much easier if you have a bipolar to bipolar very delicately that area, or if you take the argon beam and use the argon beam because it won't have as much penetration, so you won't make the leak worse, but you'll get your hemostasis. Please leave a drain right? I mean, there are a lot of HPV surgeons in here. We, we all love drains, and we love to have conversations about drains. I mean, how many academic debates do we have about the drain? But for something like this, you're better off putting the drain in, and then you can check the drain amylase postoperatively and make sure that the level is low. And if the level is low, you can go ahead and pull it out. What is the exact number you need to be able to pull a drain? I think that is still under debate, right? So we usually do it if the amylase is less than 600 and the volume is low, so less than 20 or 30 cc's in a 24-hour period. If you have a high volume drain output and the amylase is five or 600, you probably are better off leaving it in place because it's easier to leave a drain than having to put another drain in. Then you have the parenchymal injury where you do have involvement of the main pancreatic duct. And that can lead to a fairly significant high output fistula. And there you have to decide, you know, can you resect a small portion of the pancreatic tail so that you can get a good seal, sort of almost like a mini distal pancreatectomy. And again, this of course depends on how far are you down the body of the pancreas. Um, or if you don't feel comfortable, you can leave a bunch of drains um, 
if no colleague is available to help um, to assess it. Ideally, you leave the spleen in place and you don't, you know, need to um, remove that as well because that then just ends up being a much larger operation than you were planning. And then, of course, the worst case scenario, and I don't think arterial injury is as bad as splenic vein injury when you're getting into the parenchyma of the pancreas, that ends up being a very, very different scenario. And obviously, getting hemostasis first is going to be the most important thing that you do uh, to make sure that you don't have significant blood loss for the patient. And in those cases, you do really need to consider distal pancreatectomy. And you can think about the Warshaw technique. And the Warshaw technique is you can take the splenic artery and the splenic vein with the parenchymal transection, and the spleen survives off of the short gastrics. I will tell you, in older patients and in patients who are or were heavy smokers, it tends not to work. It tends, they tend to not have enough uh, blood supply off their short gastrics to be able to save their spleen. So just very quickly, for the HPV surgeons have seen this a thousand times, and the non-HPV surgeons probably are not going to need to know this, but it, this is basically a classification of the different types of fistulas, and it has to do with output and amylase level. And you can see here the grade B and grade C pancreatic fistulas are the ones that we worry about. The Bs can usually be managed with an interventional radiology drain. The Cs then may need another reoperation and cause significant morbidity for the patient. So we sometimes get asked, well, should we put everybody on octreotide or pasreotide? So pasreotide is incredibly expensive. Octreotide is also very expensive. So depending on your institution, they may give you quite a bit of pushback to put it on. This is the clinical trial that Peter Allen ran out of um, Sloan Kettering looking at this when doing formal pancreatic resections, and it did seem to improve the pancreatic fistula rate. There was another second trial where they were looking at living, giving pasreotide or steroids to see if they could decrease the fistula rate. And it does look like the pasreotide did have some effect on decreasing your pancreatic fistula rate. So I do think that if you have a fairly significant pancreatic injury, it is worthwhile considering this, especially um, when you are doing this for a completely different reason than uh, pancreatic resection. I will tell you, though, that all of the meta-analyses and the retrospective reviews have not shown a benefit. But I do think we have to keep in mind that the prospective trials are probably more solid data than the retrospective ones. So in conclusion, pancreatic tail injury following splenic flexure mobilization is very rare. Um, we try to avoid unnecessary cauterization so that you don't cause a further injury. Just use the bipolar or the argon beam. And then treatment, of course, depends on the degree of the injury. And hopefully most of them are very superficial injuries so that the, there's not any significant resection that needs to be done. And you can consider somatostatin analogs. Again, depends on what institution you're in and, and how high of a pancreatic fistula you think that you have when looking at the drain output and the drain amylase. So thank you.